Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Data Cloud Now. I'm currently in Las Vegas, where I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Beal, co-head of Enterprise Data Science Specialist at Bloomberg. Michael, such a pleasure to have you on the program today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Michael, the Bloomberg terminal revolutionized the industry by bringing transparency to the financial markets. More than four decades on, it remains at the cutting edge of innovation and information delivery. As the financial services industry invests in the latest technologies, we've seen an increased demand of large volumes of data to run these systems in the enterprise. How does Bloomberg's data strategy continue to lead the way and what trends are emerging from your seat? It's a great question, and since the early 1980s, our clients have truly depended upon Bloomberg to be able to bring transparency to opaque markets. As clients are needing data in real time and markets are moving faster and faster, that continues to put a lot of pressure on our systems. And every day, our systems are ingesting over 400 billion message ticks of different trades. Those are coming from exchanges all across the world and they're coming in real time 24-7. In addition to the actual trade data, the same thing is happening with news. We're ingesting over 2 million uh, news articles per day in multiple languages from multiple regions. And so that puts a lot of pressure on our systems because clients need it to always be up. They need the data to always be ready. And therefore, we've had to put a lot of time around our ability to ingest data at scale to be able to bring together all of these abstract and different entities and have a common understanding as to what the information relies upon, as well as how are we going to tie that together and aggregate it to be able to provide insights to our terminal users who are really looking for an answer, not the understanding data. And as we've done that, now we have this rich corpus of entities and interconnectedness and information, as well as the point in time historical data that has truly been in strong demand for those who want to go without a terminal and really just want the data for their data science workflows. And that's really been the effort that we've put together behind the Bloomberg Enterprise Data uh, Research Solutions. Great insights. Thank you for that, Michael. How does Snowflake's ease of use benefit your ecosystem on a global scale? That's a great question, and I love your word of ease of use, because that has really been core to Bloomberg's strategy. We want to make things easy for our clients to work with. And if you look at the trend over the last five to 10 years, ease of use means having the data where you need it, when you need it, and particularly in cloud native deliveries. And so back in 2018, we were actually the very first financial services data provider to announce our partnership with AWS, actually at the 2018 reInvent, of our ability to make the data natively uh, accessible in AWS, as well as to be able to do that in real time with our B-Pipe solutions. So now as you look at Snowflake, you know, the, our actual demand of our Data License Plus product within Snowflake has risen over five-fold over the last two years, right? And why is that? One, it's because clients need to have a centralized place where they can manage the entitlements associated with their data. And we, our unique uh, primary keys and linking methodology works very well within the Snowflake ecosystem, such that once you have access and permissions to a given data, you no longer have to think about how are you going to join it, how are you going to merge it, uh, and, there, and you can focus in on the actual analytics. So this combination of Snowflake being one of the best in class at that ability to be able to have quick access to your data in a very controlled manner, as well as with upstream applications that actually make the uses much easier, fits very well with our strategy of putting data where clients need it, making it ensure that it's a very high quality, and making it very easy to identify how do you tie and stitch together our various data sets. So I think that combination of kind of the, the smoothness of integration, uh, the management of the entitlements, as well as the uh, upstream integration with visualization and analytical apps, you know, truly helps explain the tremendous explosion in uh, demand that we've seen from our clients for the Snowflake ecosystem. Thank you, Michael. AI has long been tied to the financial services sector. With regards to your customer base, what use cases are leading the way? It's a great question. And you know, the AI use cases are spanning the gamut, right? But they are consistent. Actually, three out of every four conversations that I have with a client have to do with AI in one shape or manner or form or the other. And Bloomberg is very well positioned to actually be able to have those conversations with the clients and to help them as they're on this AI journey because we've been at it for a very long time. 
actually since 2009, we first started to put ML into production with our sentiment analysis. And then later in 2022, we really were leaders around the LLM movement and our you know, pretty famous paper of uh, Bloomberg GPT, which we'll later be presenting on today at the AWS reInvent conference. So as you look at actually what are those problems that they're, that they're looking for, obviously it's you know, how am I making better forecasts? Um, how can I actually give more information to my LLM, right, and try to avoid it from hallucinating, which requires structured data to be able to incorporate into those workflows. So regardless of whether it's a prediction, a summarization, a visualization problem, or increasingly more workflow automation, the key that comes down to each component of that conversation is not necessarily the hyperparameter tunings or the math behind it, but really a clear understanding of is the data of very high quality? Will I be able to link it with other different data sets? And is it going to give me a good representation of actually what happened back then with the point in time nature of it? Right? As you look through this evolution of AI overall, we've moved from an expectation that it's all going to be faster compute, more complicated models, to a realization that regardless of how much you try to hypertune and fine tune, the data is what's going to be able to drive intelligent insights out of the machines. And so we've really had a great time witnessing this evolution of the industry as people are looking for both real-time and historical use cases with a clear understanding of providing their machines the data that they need to be able to make trustable and insightful res uh, recommendations. Great insights and perspective there, Michael. Given your position within the marketplace, you have a unique perspective on what's next. Where do you see AI having the most impact in the year ahead? It's a great question, and truly AI is due for a breakout year in terms of actually delivering real value in 2025. And it, two low-hanging fruits in places where I actually see that happening and clients moving from the POC to the actual implementation are around analyzing and gathering insights. Right? And if you look within Bloomberg, we've spent a tremendous amount of time and are very proud of the work that we've been able to do in terms of something that we call text to BQL, right? which is similar to SQL, uh, but is Bloomberg's query language, which is very powerful, enables analysis across all of the various securities and aggregations, but as a result of its power is also complex. And so through that approach of leveraging LLMs, we've really been able to transform the end user's results such that they don't necessarily have to speak in Bloomberg language, can speak in a natural tone that's consistent with them, and then expect for the uh, analytics to be able to figure out and provide the data that they're looking for. So I think that that's one that's really going to make a crossover and will have a big impact for our terminal users in particular. Um, another side that we're actually seeing a tremendous amount of um, growth and again, a movement from POCs into actual production is around the idea of feeding information to the LLM, right? I think a year or two years ago, everybody was complaining about hallucinations, but it really is a function of what data are you actually providing the LLM in that given context window. And so we're really excited about the movements that we're seeing of people actually moving away from or moving on from just retrieval augmented generation with text where you can use transcripts or research that makes sense, uh, to also being able to incorporate structured data into that so that you can answer simple questions such as, today, what is the price of Apple? Or what's happening to EBITDA margins? And more complex trends to where are the trends actually happening? Who's taking market share? And so as we've taken these types of innovations and learnings from applying large language models to improve our terminal users, we then have recircled that back into our actual data products to help our enterprise data clients with improved and uh, better data. And I'll give you two examples around that. One is our supply chain data set, which is incredibly popular because it actually provides the interconnectedness of our society and our companies. Who is the supplier? Who is the uh, customer? Now, through that, most of that information is sourced directly from a 10K. However, if, a, if I am your customer, we only have to disclose that if I'm over 10%, right? So what about all of these other relationships that are just being uh, mentioned in news articles or in the press otherwise? Well, that's not efficient to be able to throw humans to actually be able to scan that. But we can do that with large language models and leveraging the uh, innovations and uh, specialties that we've developed by improving the terminal, we're now able to apply that to be able to expand our relationships within the supply chain. And also, as you think about other components of not just LLM, but traditional machine learning and forecasting, 
you know, the credit markets are incredibly difficult to be able to model, right? They're e-liquid, there are transactions that are not coming in regular intervals, uh, and they are impacted by lots of different variables. Again, that is a great application for machine learning, to be able to now provide to our terminal clients the ability to, for any security that they're holding, to be able to have a liquidity profile for that, uh, leveraging machine learning of over 150 different factors, and then also to circulate that back down as a raw data product for other clients, such that, yes, there is machine learning driving that, but not every client necessarily has to do the analysis. In certain instances, we can do that and provide that as a data feed for them. Really appreciate those examples. Thank you, Michael. We're currently in Las Vegas for AWS reInvent. What's top of mind for you while on site, and how is Bloomberg showing up big this week? You know, Bloomberg's a huge company, and we've been around for a long time, but at our core, we are a fintech, right? And so across the organization, we have both engineers that are here to learn, we have our third party uh, development and partnerships team, which is here to find the most innovative and fast growing uh, cloud and machine learning and other partners that we can uh, work with to improve our clients' outcomes. And then we have some you know, great presentations that we're making uh, to help the overall industry understand some of the innovations that we've made. And in particular, actually yesterday, I presented around our virtual data room initiative, uh, which is really the first time that we can provide a secure environment for clients to be able to test drive our data prior to actually purchasing it, which we've never been able to do because we can't share data in a contractual manner. But this innovation enabled us to be able to do it in a manner where it can be read but not written. Later on today, I will actually be presenting at the Snowflake stage, where we'll be talking about applications of uh, machine learning and uh, data science for the analysis of company risk, as well as uh, fund flows and seeing where assets and investors have been investing since the election. All right, and later today, I'm incredibly excited to go to a presentation by two of our senior colleagues over in the office of the CTO, as well as AI Engineering, where they'll present on some of the research that they embarked on on large language models, as well as the lessons learned when we were creating the Bloomberg GPT paper, and some of the innovations that we've put into generative AI in order to improve our products. It's clearly all happening here at reInvent this week, Michael. What's next for Bloomberg when it comes to enterprise data? We're continuing to listen to our customers with that clear focus of how can we make things easier, how can we help you get to value faster. Right? And so it's consistent. They want to see better, faster, easier integrations with our cloud providers, and we will continue to work on that, uh, and we're very excited through that. Second to that is really ensuring that as we have high quality data, that we're continuously focused on that mantra of high quality point in time data and continuously building out a new suite of research-focused products that will enable particularly AI-driven and data science workflows. And finally, we're continuously taking these innovations that we've built internally to improve the terminal and figuring out how do we make that a, a way to improve our data products such that our clients do not have to continuously recreate the wheel. Right? They may want to continuously drive an innovation, but in order to do that, they need to have a great benchmark to compare that with. And our machine learning, our uh, use of, of generative AI will help them along those uh, manners. And most importantly, our strong, high quality data, the interconnectedness of our data sets, and the point in time nature of the observations that are being uh, shown to our clients will enable them to you know, continuously have strong and insightful predictions as they continue their journey towards the cloud migration. And we're just excited to be there with them every step of the way. Well, it's an exciting next chapter indeed, Michael. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. And for the audience watching, I'm Ryan Green with Data Cloud Now. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you soon.